thanks everybody for for joining here. It's good to see this nice um, crowd of people and to learn about iNaturalist and how it's such a powerful tool for um, documenting the biodiversity um, of anywhere you are in the world. So it's not just Maryland, it's not just plants, but we are going to focus on plants. Um, we, meaning Deborah Barber, is going to focus on this. And hopefully she'll tell you a lot about the various um, iNaturalist activities that she's involved with, which are really exciting monthly talks and um, tutorials that happen. So I'm sure she'll tell us more about that. But I just wanted to um, introduce Deborah because she's um, the Director of Land Con um, Conservation for the Maryland DC chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And um, she's responsible for all the chapter's land holdings, including the easements, and the public preserves for their conservation research and recreational value. And she's been um, really um, gung-ho on getting iNaturalist to be in almost everybody's pocket. Deborah, thank you very much for um, agreeing to do this talk and really looking forward to it. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. With your newfound iNaturalist skills, I invite you to come along with me to one of our preserves in Dorchester County called Robinson Neck Preserve and do a little bio blitz, not just plants, but all taxa. And iNaturalist can help you to be confident and competent at documenting all taxa, not just plants. And the reason I want to develop a, uh, a species list, a more comprehensive species list for Robinson Neck Preserve is we are deepening our relationship with the local indigenous community, particularly at that preserve. We've been working for a couple of years with the Nassawaywash band of the Nanticoke Indians, and um, we're doing some really exciting work with them, and we will be developing a, a collection permit for non-endangered plants um, that have traditional cultural uses. So I want to have a, a, a pinpointed uh, documented set of plant observations and any species observations for a Robinson Neck Preserve because on iNaturalist, they can look at these things and they can know exactly where to go. So um, it'll be a great species list for use by anybody who's interested in the biota of Robinson Neck Preserve, but will definitely get use by the Nassaway Wash Band of the Nanticoke Indians. So I hope that you will join me on Saturday, May 11th at low tide because Robinson Neck is getting harder and harder to get to because that's what's happening to Georgechester County. Um, we will meet in a big parking lot in Cambridge and we will make our way down to the preserve in as few vehicles as possible because there's not a lot of parking at that preserve. And I'll have a map so that you know when you're on the preserve and when you're off. It's big, 900 acres, so it'll be hard to get off the preserve. And we will just go wherever the spirit takes us uh, with one buddy at least, maybe more, and use iNaturalist to document every kind of living thing that we see there. Even if you don't know exactly what it is, if you're getting good quality pictures and upload them to iNaturalist, there's a good chance that those species will be identified later by the iNaturalist community. So I hope you'll consider joining me on that date. I'm very excited about it. So let me tell you a little bit more about my relationship to iNaturalist. I've been using it for about six years. I was asked to lead a field trip for the City Nature Challenge uh, at that time, and I didn't know anything about what I naturalist was. I didn't know what the City Nature Challenge was, but I can lead field trips. So I agreed to lead a trip in the Potomac Gorge, as pictured behind me, one of my happy places on the planet. And um, in the weeks leading up to the field trip, I started attending calls of the regional organizers group for the City Nature Challenge and came to understand that iNaturalist is a really pretty cool, amazing tool that can take the place of a lot of things that people are doing or complement a lot of things people are doing to understand what they're seeing in the natural world. Field guides are still very important. I am not suggesting you throw out your field guides, but I am suggesting that when I go to Australia in a couple of months to visit my son who's in college, with iNaturalist on my cell phone, I don't need to bring or invest in a whole suitcase full of field guides for this new geography, Australia. 
because I naturalist is going to get me most of the way there towards understanding what I'm seeing, learning about it, and also connecting with naturalists in Australia and worldwide. So I will be sharing some slides to show you a little bit more precisely about how those good things can happen for you as well. I'm going to give you an overview of some of the cool things you can do with iNaturalist, hopefully deepen some of your skills for those who are already using it and for those who are not already using it, get you excited about using it in time for this weekend, because this weekend is the City Nature Challenge, a friendly global bio blitz taking place worldwide in more than 600 metropolitan areas. Okay, so when I'm going to Australia, I want to get an idea of some of the cool stuff that I might see. I can do that both on my smartphone and I can do it on the desktop. So my slides that are screenshots of smartphones will be iPhone centric because that's what I have. But I can assure you that the Android version of the iNaturalist app does everything that the iPhone version does. In fact, the Android version does some of these things better. Um, the buttons might look a little bit different or be in slightly different places, but they are all there for you to find them. So get yourself the iNaturalist app. It's free. Download it now if you don't already have it. Uh, set up a user account. Make yourself a username. They can reveal your identity, partially reveal your identity like mine, dbarber. Um, or they can just leave your real identity in complete mystery. They can be funny, they can be cute, they can be anything that you want, and you can change your new username later on if you want to. So don't stress about your username. All right, great. So on the app, on my smartphone app, this is what it looks like when I'm in explore mode. I've got this little bar of buttons at the bottom and I've clicked this one that looks like the globe to get into explore mode. And when I'm in explore mode, I have three different views, three different ways I can look at the information. So this is the map view of the explore mode. And when I'm in the map view, by default, it pulls up the place that I am in. This is not where I am right now because I took the screenshot when I was in, uh, I think I was traveling to San Antonio. Um, yeah, I was. I was in San Antonio, but that's where I was at the time that I took the screenshot. Um, and all of these little pins represent observations that people have made. An observation is one iNaturalist user's interaction with an organism in a certain time and a certain place. And there's some color coding to the, uh, the pins that represent the iNaturalist observations. If I were to click on these pins, uh, the green ones would show me plants. The red ones would show me, uh, I think it's invertebrates. The blue ones would show me vertebrates. The orange ones would show me something else. There's a dark purple one for like slime molds. So there's some useful color coding there. Um, and I could click on those individual observations and I could see what somebody saw in a, a place near me. So that's really useful, helpful information. I can also go to the grid view in explore mode. I can go to the grid view, which looks like that. So I can see the actual pictures that people have taken and I can see the current uh, identification of what that observation is. Further, I can go to the list view of explore mode. I can still see the, the first picture in the observation, but I can also see um, a little bit more about the observation. I can see that I made that one, that's me. I can see when I made it. I can see whether it's research grade or not. And research grade means that there is a high degree of consensus about the species identification. Research grade observations periodically get ingested into GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is a worldwide database of uh, species distributions around the globe, uh, along with along with information about that from other sources. iNaturalist is not the only source at all, but is an important contributor to GBIF. So people who are doing research can download that information from GBIF. Um, I've done that. It comes in the form of a big spreadsheet, which you can slice and dice and process, and you can verify the observations if they're on iNaturalist. You can do all kinds of things with it. And that kind of information has been used 
in hundreds of scholarly research papers from around the world. So when you use iNaturalist, you are not only getting suggestions about what is the species that you're observing, those suggestions coming from both computer vision and from the community of real life people like you and me, both citizen scientists and professional scientists weighing in on what the identification is for that observation. So you're getting that identification function kind of two pronged. You are also contributing information about that observation to science via GBIF. So I think that's very, very exciting. All right, so you also have an explore function in iNaturalist on the desktop. When you pull up iNaturalist and when you log in, you know you're logged in because you can see your little profile thumbnail there. You can go to explore mode and you have several different ways of looking at that information as well. You have the map way of looking at it. Um, the first thing that pulls up is all the identifications all over the world. So that's really overwhelming, but I would suggest uh, zooming in on the geography that you're interested in. And I want you to know you also have the grid way of looking at that information and the list way of looking at that information. In addition, on the desktop, you've got the filter, which is an extremely powerful little tool. You can also narrow down your, um, your inquiry by typing in any taxon. It says species here, but you could just type in a genus, a family, a tribe, you would you would just get a filtered set of observations that um, fits within the taxon that you've typed in. You can also type in a location. So if you only want to see observations that have been made in the state of Maryland, you can type it in there into the location field and then hit go. And um, you can search on multiple things at one time by opening up the filter. I often say the filter is your friend. It, it really is very, very powerful. You can also use these little shapes to specify a geographic area of interest. So all of these things are available to you um, in explore mode on the desktop. It's amazing. iNaturalist is amazing on the smartphone, but there are even more functions and more information available to you on the desktop. So if you are like me and you've only for the first few years of your relationship with iNaturalist, use it on your smartphone, that's great, but look at it on the desktop as well, and you'll be really amazed and really pleased, I think. Okay, so I like to use iNaturalist to become a better naturalist. I was a decent naturalist before. I've worked with the Nature Conservancy for more than 30 years, and I've had the, the privilege of, of working alongside and learning from some really amazing naturalists. And all of my observation skills and my critical thinking skills have gotten better honed and sharper by using iNaturalist. And again, iNaturalist is super awesome for many reasons, but one of them is that it covers all taxa, not just plants, not just birds, not just herbs, not just fungus, everything that is living. And it's the intention, it's the focus of iNaturalist to capture information about wild species of any taxon, any kingdom, um, anything that has been alive in the last 100 years. So it doesn't, it's not intended to help you identify fossils, but it is intended to help you identify traces of life, evidence of life from things like tracks, shed skins, nests, gulls, leaf mines, all of those things are fair game for iNaturalist because they are evidence of an organism that has been alive in the last 100 years. So the way to get started with it all is to make some observations. So on the smartphone, specifically on the uh, iPhone, this is what it looks like. When I have my iPhone in the field or in my neighborhood and I see a sidewalk weed that I don't recognize, or um, I'm in the garden and I see a new bug and I wanna know who's my new friend because I garden for the bugs, not against the bugs. I open up iNaturalist and I go into observe mode and this is what it looks like. So when I go into observe mode, I have a choice. I can take a picture directly within the app or 
which is what I do more often when I'm in the field. I just take pictures while I'm in the field and I wait until I'm home to upload them all at one time in the comfort of my own home um, with my free wireless rather than my expensive uh, cellular service. Um, so I tend to, when I'm making observations, do, do, do it at home and upload photos from my photo library. So I go right here. So iNaturalist makes it easy um, to upload multiple photos for a single organism to make one observation. It used to be four at a time for the iPhone app. It is now easily eight at a time with the iPhone app. And I do very much recommend that you use multiple photos to document a single organism because it's very hard to capture all the important qualities of a single organism with one photo. For example, you can often spot a new iNaturalist user by noting that they have an observation which consists of one photo of a beautiful little violet face, but no pictures of the leaves, no pictures of the stem, no pictures of the overall sense of the plant, no pictures of the back of the beautiful little violet face. So capture as much of that information as possible with multiple photos in a single observation. That is giving you a higher quality observation and increasing the chance that you will get a positive species ID. I will point out here that it's really great and helpful to get a picture of the underside of the leaf of the plant as well. In fact, Margaret Chatham, uh, whom some of you may know, she's a Virginian, but very active in the native plant community. If I forget to submit a photo of the underside of the leaf in one of my observations, she will remind me, she will let me know. Um, she will type a comment into my observation. I really wish that you would turn that leaf over. Then I could know that it was such and such rather than such and such. So multiple photos, that's the key information there. When you've uploaded your multiple photos, when you've added your multiple photos to the observation, you can easily change which one is the default photo by clicking on these radio buttons. iNaturalist's computer vision suggestions of species are, are just linked to the first photo in the observation. So if you feel like this is the most typical photo, make that the first one, the default one, um, by, by leaving it there. But if you feel like this is actually a more typical photo, then click that radio button. This photo will be moved to the default position, and that's the photo that the computer vision will run its algorithm on. When you make your observation, um, the next thing you do is click, what did you see? And when you click on that, all kinds of really cool things happen. For example, even if you have no idea what you're seeing, and this is a picture that I took when I was on a little work trip in the Southwest, I was seeing all kinds of plants I didn't recognize, but I naturalist looked at that photo and told me that it was pretty sure based on the computer vision that this species was in the genus Borhavia. Who knows if that's how it's actually pronounced. And it made several different suggestions about what the specific species was. And it told me that it made these suggestions based on visual similarity and on the fact that that species is expected nearby. So that is all really helpful information, but I was not content to leave it there. I knew that if I clicked on these little individual symbols, little eye symbols next to each species suggestion, I could get to more information about that species. If you click on that little eye and there's something else you click on the, the Android, it's a different symbol, but it does the same thing. So look for it if you're Android users. When I click on that little eye, it pulls up another little page that gives me me multiple photos of that species to scroll through so that I can compare and contrast. It shows me a picture of the range of that species as reported on iNaturalist and where and a little pin showing where my observation is so I can see if I'm in range or out of range or edge of range. So that's very, very worth doing. A lot of people don't even notice that little eye because it's so teeny. Um, but I want you to know it's there because it's very useful and powerful. So something else that you can do uh, when you're making an observation, note that the date, the time and date information are uploaded with your photo automatically. 
Another thing that's uploaded with your photo automatically, as long as you have your settings set um, to uh, to attach geolocation to your photos in your iPhone. Um, you Oh, good point. Yeah, on Android, you click on the photo itself to learn more about the organism. That's right. I remember I learned that last weekend and I forgot. So thanks for the reminder. Um, so the, the location is attached to your photo as metadata. Do you need to share the precise location of your observation? No, you do not. You have the option to choose from three levels of geoprivacy. If you choose open, then that will show based on the accuracy of the GPS unit in your cell phone, um, that will show pretty much where that observation was made. And that is fine in many, many cases, but that's not your only option. Another option that you have when you click on uh, geo privacy, you can leave it as open, you can set it to obscured, and you can also choose private. If you choose obscured geo privacy, that will give other users a different kind of symbol rather than being a pointy little pin dropped exactly on the spot other users will see a circle with a dot in it so that tells other users that they are seeing the approximate location of that observation and it drops that observation down at a random place within like, I don't know, two minutes or something. I forget what the exact size is, but a random place kind of nearby, but not accurately enough that anybody could uh, look at that observation and go looking for that that organism. So I use obscure geo privacy if I am on private land that is not my own. Uh, for example, when I was helping a friend do a bio blitz of his, his uh 300 acres that he acquired in West Virginia. He wanted all the people participating in that bio blitz to obscure the geo privacy so that his property did not show up as the incredible biological hotspot that it is. So we were all very happy to do that. Another setting that you can choose is private. If you choose private geo privacy, then people will see this looks really funny when you look at observations where it's set to private. They will see a dot on uh, not even on a map. So other users will not even be able to see what continent your observation is on. I not really sure why you would want to do that because you're almost never going to get confirming species IDs for an organism that people can't tell if it's in North America, South America, Africa, Antarctica, wherever. I think that you are very safe using obscure geo privacy for anything that you're not comfortable about sharing the location with one caveat. If something is highly, highly um, sensitive or collectible, like the only population of a certain orchid in a state, I don't even take pictures of things like that. Um, I certainly don't post them to Facebook. I just don't have anything like that in on the internet for, for my own observations. Uh, you should also know that iNaturalist automatically obscures the locations of RTE species and certain non-RTE species that are charismatic, collectible, or otherwise vulnerable. For example, the eastern box turtle. iNaturalist does that for you. As soon as you say it's a box turtle or the computer ID says it's a box turtle, the location is, is obscured for all users besides the person who made the observation. All right. Great. So I see a couple questions in the chat, which I will take a breather and I will attempt to address those. So Nancy says locations don't come up when I'm using the camera and app. Where's the setting to allow the location? I'm on an iPhone. So I think that you need to go into your your um your iPhone settings, not your iNaturalist settings, but your iPhone settings and look for something like location or privacy. And there's a place where you can select uh, what information about your location you share with various apps, including the camera app. So look in your iPhone settings um, and I think you'll find it. And if you can't, then I'll stay on a little bit later um, to answer some specific one-on-one -on -one questions. So I'll try to help you at that time. Hey, Deborah, just for that answer, and I'll type it yeah, in yeah. the 
the chat is okay. um, you go in, in your settings of the iPhone and then look down and find the iNaturalist app. And then you'll be able to change the locations to be while using the app. That that too. There's a couple places yeah. that you should check your settings. Um, the the iNaturalist settings and the phone settings. So thank you for that. And then Dan is asking, why doesn't my location automatically show up? I think that may have to do with your iNaturalist settings or your i or your smartphone settings. Okay. Great. So another thing that I want you to think about not always sticking with the default for. Um, so where do you go to change geo privacy on an, on an observation? You go right there where it says geo privacy. You just tap that and that will pull up these different choices. And then you tap the choice that you want. That's how you change the, the um, geo privacy of an observation. So another place to consider not going with the default settings is captive and cultivated. Remember I mentioned that the intent of iNaturalist is to capture information about wild species. Is it okay to use iNaturalist to record the phenology of plants in your native plant garden? Yes, it is, as long as you say, this is a captive or cultivated plant. What I do sometimes is when something comes into bloom in my native plant garden that I manage, um, I want to capture, okay, I want to capture when the obedient plant is blooming. So I will take a picture of it and I'll record it, but I will say captive or cultivated, yes, this is what it looks like. I click on that and these two choices come up and I say captive, yes. And in the comment or in the notes section of my observation, I write for phenology, um, just so that people know that I know know that uh, iNaturalist is, is really designed for catching information about wild species. I might say, um, planted in native plant garden, picture taken for phenology. So you can do the same as well. And so it is completely fine to use iNaturalist to record and even to learn the identifications of captive and cultivated species, as long as you say it's captive or cultivated, because that way it does not get to research grade and it doesn't start to and found the information that is uh, rapidly aggregating about where species are voluntarily occurring on the planet. How naturalized species are dealt with is a little bit, it's a gray area. It's a gray area. So when something, when a question like that, uh, when you can't find your answer by looking at the help section at the bottom of every iNaturalist page, then the next place to go is to the iNaturalist forum. And you can get to the iNaturalist forum from your home page, and what what people often say is that the suppose we did a tree planting. We do tree plantings all the time at the Nature Conservancy. Um, we do, for example, reintroductions of things that were nearly wiped out, like Atlantic white cedar on our on our Nassawango preserve. So we've planted replanted thousands of Atlantic white cedar seedlings. I would not record any of those guys that we directly planted um, unless I said that they were captive or cultivated. But when those Atlantic white cedars start to grow up and reproduce on their own and start making babies that are persisting in the restoration area, I would feel more free to capture those observations of those babies, my grandchildren after all, um, in, in their new habitat. And I would probably put a note that this was a second generation of trees planted in a restoration area. So all of those things can happen before you even upload, but when you do upload your observation, you have just become a citizen scientist. And uploading your observation is what puts your observation and the evidence that you've provided in it, in the form of photos or audio recordings, puts that evidence in front of the eyes of citizen and professional scientists worldwide. So why, what's in it for you? Why should you upload? Why don't you just keep all the information on your phone and benefit from the computer vision, but not bother to upload? Because you get feedback from this wonderful, global, kind, 
helpful, and constructive community of iNaturalist users. How do you know that you're getting some feedback from them? You know that by checking your updates. So check your activity button on your smartphone app, and you will see that Prairie Rambler gave me a suggestion of about the species. When I posted that, I said it was some kind of uh, pas paspalum, I don't know how that's pronounced, grass, but Prairie Rambler refined my identification and said, not only is it a paspalum, it's a rusty seed paspalum. So um, when I was, when I'm in unfamiliar geographies, I get a lot of really helpful identifications from local folks who are far more knowledgeable about the, the local flora than I am. So that is really, really helpful and I super appreciate it. Okay, so a lot of you said that you use iNaturalist to document biodiversity or document plants. I use it that way too. In fact, all of my observations, my iNaturalist observations in their thousands, I feel like they're my little my little breadcrumb trail of cool places I've been uh, throughout the last few years in natural areas. And I really value my observation set. Um, so when I'm on the desktop, I can go to, and I'm logged in, you can see I'm logged in here. I go to my observations and that pulls up only observations by me, D Barber. So I have a little heat map showing the places that I've spent the most time. Uh, I hope that after my trip this summer, um, my heat map will show all kinds of observations in Western Australia. And I have the same several ways of looking at those observations. I can look at the map view. I can look at the grid view. I can look at the list view. So um, I, I'm, I, I treasure my observation set. It reminds me of so many cool places I've been and things I've seen and things I've learned. So so you can easily see your observations by going to the desktop and clicking your observations. Okay, so you, some of you said that you use that you use iNaturalist to document stuff you've seen. It is very easy using iNaturalist to also have those observations contribute to the very wonderful, amazing Maryland Biodiversity Project. So. If you um, if you join the project and you do some things in your settings, the the curators of the Maryland Biodiversity Project can easily scoop your observations in once they're verified, and those will show up on Maryland Biodiversity. So here's a page that you can go to on the Maryland Biodiversity Project webpage. You can see all, all of these hundreds of thousands of observations have been ingested from iNaturalist to MBP, all of these different taxa, all of these different iNaturalist users, and I find that very exciting. So you can see, for example, I took this, um, I took this screenshot just today. So you can see that a good a, a good plenty of the observations being added to Maryland Biodiversity Project are coming via iNaturalist. And if you want to contribute to MBP, doing it through iNaturalist is really a very easy way to go because you hardly have to do anything. Back in the old days when you had to put your photos on Flickr or other things, I just I just got stuck. I stopped. I just couldn't. I just couldn't figure out how to do it. But I use iNaturalist and I use iNaturalist in Maryland and I've given the curators um, permission to view the specific locations, even of my obscured observations, so they can drop down my observations into the topo quad the way they like to do on the Maryland Biodiversity Project site. Okay, so one of the things that I have enjoyed more in recent years after um, I got to be a pretty comfortable iNaturalist user and observer was I learned the, the joys and the satisfaction of becoming an iNaturalist identifier. So I've mentioned that iNaturalist computer vision is the first step. When you uh, click on that, what did you see field, then the computer vision within the app uh, makes a pretty credible species identification based on all kinds of stuff that I don't understand. 
And that computer vision is getting better and better because the computer vision algorithm is retrained monthly. So I have seen a huge increase in the quality of iNaturalist computer vision suggestions about what species are during the time that I've used it because that computer vision just gets better and better and better. But iNaturalist doesn't leave it there. Um, the One of the really magical things about iNaturalist is when a real person comes in and makes a, a, a identification improvement or correction or um, just in some other way interacts with your with your observation. So you can contribute to that magical feeling for iNaturalist users by becoming an iNaturalist identifier yourself. So let me just show you an example. I was in the field and I thought I was seeing Jack in the pulpit. It's not something that I'm terribly familiar with. And then this person who is a real champion, I naturalist identifier came in and suggested that it was in fact small Jack in the pulpit and didn't just say, take my word for it. This I naturalist identifier, Tom Norton um, is very prolific, very, accurate, very courteous, very constructive, like the vast majority of iNaturalist users. He said this really helpful stuff. I think this might be Erosema pusillum because the spadix is quite narrow and cylindrical, not clavate, and the leaves appear to be green underneath, not glaucous. Nice find. And I was like, yay, that's a new species for me. So that was really great. And then um, I, I went ahead and I withdrew my original species identification by, at the time, there was a little agree button next to his species identification. And he convinced me. Um, I did a little bit of research on my own. I looked at some more pictures of small Jack in the pulpit, which I could easily do by just clicking on this link. And that got me to the taxon page for small Jack in the pulpit. And I looked back and forth. I compared, I contrasted, I decided, yeah, I don't need to just take Tom Norton's word for it. I believe it myself. So I hit the little agree button and then that automatically withdrew my my original ID and changed it a little further down on the page. You can't see it in this screenshot to an identification that agreed with his. So that's an example of how the iNaturalist identifier community can be really helpful to observers by um, refining their identifications, helping them learn new things. And I am both grateful to the iNaturalist identifier community and I'm proud now to be a part of it. In fact, I'm so proud to be a part of it that I organize monthly identification nights on iNaturalist. And I frequently see Karen Molinas on, on those. We have a Zoom session the second Tuesday of every month in which we get together and we usually hear a presentation by a, a, a guest who talks about spiders or evergreens or fungi um, for, for usually between 20 and 40 minute presentation. And then we get into Zoom virtual breakout rooms and we work together on identifying DC area observations in iNaturalist. Um, we can break out into breakout rooms based on um, different taxa or just, just anything using that iNaturalist filter. And we will be having two identification nights the week after the City Nature Challenge. Um, this was something that was important for me to start organizing because I know that the City Nature Challenge pulls in a lot of brand new iNaturalist users. And I want those people very early in their uh, relationship with iNaturalist to experience that really magical feeling that you get when a real person comes in and constructively interacts with your observation. So the iNaturalist identification nights that we have right after the City Nature Challenge are people like you and me getting into identify mode on their desktops, scrolling through observations that need to be identified and saying helpful things like this. Anybody can do it because there's a whole bunch of observations that are not even tagged uh, with with broad taxa. There's a whole bunch of stuff that just shows up as unknown because we've got new iNaturalist users who didn't realize that they could just click in that what did you see field 
and um, get a good suggestion. So even somebody who's not a confident identifier can go through all the ones that are there as unknown and they can say, this is a bird, this is a mammal, this is a fungus. And then that throws those observations into a different bucket where the people who are experienced at identifying those taxa can more easily find them. It can be a whole lot of fun. So um, I'm not seeing all, not going to see all the questions and, and answer them in order, but one person, Michael, hi, Michael, um, says an entomologist once commented on iNaturalist that there is too much agreeing based on less than expert opinion. What do you think? Is this unique to insects or an issue with plants as well? Um, I think it is more prevalent with insects because there are just so darn many insects that look just like each other to the untrained eye. And there are just so darn many of them, right? Um, we definitely want to encourage a culture in iNaturalist that does not default to agreeing just to be agreeable. You can be agreeable while disagreeing or correcting or refining an identification on iNaturalist. And those are some of the um, techniques that we talk in our iNaturalist identification nights about how to do. Yeah, we don't want everybody agreeing because that's going to lead to uh, wrong species identifications. We don't want that. That makes iNaturalist a less useful tool for everybody. So iNaturalist is an identification app. It is a citizen science tool. It is also a social platform. And you can use iNaturalist to connect with naturalists worldwide. And I know that some of you have heard me tell this story before, but it is still one of my very favorites. So I'm going to tell it again. Early in my relationship with iNaturalist, I was sitting down with my smartphone on my sofa with my cat in my lap and I was scrolling through observations. I learned how to filter on my smartphone on a single species and I, I filtered on wineberry, Rubus funiculasius, uh, something that I know very well because I've hired and supervised crews to control wineberry on Nature Conservancy preserves. And I was just, I was getting this feed of wineberry observations that need to be identified and I recognize it very well. So I was saying, agree, yep, agree, yep. Expanding the picture, yep, agree. I was seeing a few things that weren't it and I just put them down as rubus because I didn't know which rubus it was, but I knew it wasn't actually wineberry. So there was a couple of imposters in there that I refined the observation. Um, and I didn't think much of it. I was kind of learning more about how the app worked. And then a short time later, I got this private message because when you're on the desktop, you can get private messages from people. There's a little envelope up in the top right. And if it's red, you've got a message. So there was this guy who said, thanks for confirming the ID of my recent Wineberry observations. Good to see some international interest. And I thought, huh, okay. And he went on to say that he was in New Zealand and he was starting to see it in New Zealand. And he said he's beginning to become concerned because he's seeing it repeatedly in New Zealand. But he pointed out that it has not been uh, categorized as invasive yet, but he's getting concerned. And what do I think? And I said, wow. So I think that if your climate and soils are anything like ours, if you're seeing a few wine berries now, you have the potential to see many, many more wine berries later. And it's challenging to control because it spreads by seeds that birds poop out and it sends roots out from those little ends of the canes. And it's so prickly, it's a lot of work to control. I think that you should um, consider uh, contacting the EDRR people in New Zealand and get people to start watching for it because I think it, it could potentially be a problem for you. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? Just by doing what I do, which is look at pictures of plants and sometimes identifying them because I'm doing it on a global platform. My knowledge was made available to somebody on the other side of the planet to whom my knowledge was useful. It just made the hairs on my arms stand up. It was it was just amazing. And and I continue to have experiences like that that demonstrate how powerful a platform this is for connecting 
knowledge bearers with knowledge seekers. And I just continue to love it and continue to be amazed by what iNaturalist can do for all of us. So I have a stake in showing the world how amazing the DC area is botanically, um, with respect to species biodiversity in all taxa, and the way that I like to show the world how awesome the DC area is, is by participating in and promoting the City Nature Challenge, which I have mentioned is a global biodiversity adventure. It's a worldwide bio, bio blitz of people participating from more than uh, 600 metropolitan areas worldwide, which is happening this weekend. It starts the minute midnight Thursday turns to Friday morning, April 26th. It goes through all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, ends right before midnight on Monday night, April 29th. Any observation taken in those time parameters and within this green line on the map counts for the Washington DC metropolitan area city nature challenge. So just to situate you, this is not the prettiest map, but this is the US census met DC metropolitan area that we're using here. So here's Washington DC, here's Arlington where I sit tonight. Um, the DC area city nature challenge area goes all the way up to the Pennsylvania line in Frederick County, scoops in these two, these three Southern Maryland counties, Prince George's, Charles, and Calvert County, so we can catch a little bit of Chesapeake Bay, um, marine and brackish water biodiversity there if we go to some of the beaches in Calvert County. It covers these Northern Virginia counties and Jefferson County at the tip of the West Virginia panhandle. So any observation made during those four days this weekend um, within these geographic parameters is automatically scooped in and counts for Washington DC metro area in the City Nature Challenge. So there are things that you can do to help fulfill my dream of showing the world what a great area the DC area is, that we are so much more than lawyers and bureaucrats and politicians. You can observe on your own, you can join an event, you can lead an event, you can help with identifications. And the good news is that even though those four days of observations are very, very intense, and some of us are outside as much as possible, that we have another week after that to upload our observations and work on identifications. So I mentioned to you that when I'm in the field, I am just taking pictures, snap, 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 multiple photos, undersides of leaves, different angles, whatever I have to do, however many photos it takes for a single organism to really give a sense of what it is. I upload those all at home and then people have another week to help with concurring or divergent species identifications of those photos, of those observations. And then the results are tallied and um, this, the DC area tends to do very, very well. So we have got a group of very engaged City Nature Challenge organizers in the DC metropolitan area. Uh, we have worked together to assemble some wonderful resources on this little website. If you go to citynaturechallengedc.org, and I'll drop that in the chat a little bit later, that link, um, citynaturechallengedc.org, you get to this little website that has information about virtual events. I even listed this one that we're doing right now. Um, those are mostly wrapping up because those are mostly training events. But for this weekend, you can go to the field events tab. You can see guided field events or explore the park on your own events throughout the DC metropolitan area. And of course, you can just do observations on your own as well. Um, we've got resources assembled for participants, which means both observers and identifiers. We've got resources for walk leaders, for youth leaders. Um, and a little a little page on our monthly recurring series of virtual iNaturalist nights. So you can find all that information at citynaturechallengedc.org. And uh, we have tried to design this website to answer most of your questions, but I'm here with you in person tonight, so I can answer your questions as well. Okay, so just a couple of other things. Um, you can easily use iNaturalist and its messaging function to recruit people for your own citizen science project. I got this message. I was on the desktop and I knew that 
that I had a message because this little envelope was red. And when I opened it up, I saw that this person noticed this observation that I had made of the goblet moss. It was in a wet spot in my very own front yard. And he said, we're doing a project on goblet mosses. And here are some guidelines on the project. And he was actually, he eventually asked me, um, he, he asked me to contribute a sample. So that was easy enough. It wasn't an endangered species. And it was very easy to just pluck a little bit of that moss and send it to him for some lab work. So that is one way that you can recruit people for your citizen science project. Um, another one of my favorite stories about iNaturalist is because it makes me slow down and look at things closely. I notice things I've never noticed before. Like, like everybody, I'm getting old and sometimes I feel jaded. And um, going back to nature and looking again more closely is a way that I get myself out of those temporary feelings of jadedness. So it was during the City Nature Challenge a few years ago that I was walking very, very slowly and carefully, peering at the lawn of the neighborhood park across my street, trying to find something that I had never seen before. And I noticed this. I had definitely seen this species before, but what I noticed was that there was a whole cluster of these American American plantains that had these funnel shaped leaf deformations, not just that one plant, but a couple of dozen. And um, I posted all of those because I thought that it was so interesting and unusual. I did some Google searching and I didn't see anybody talking about any kinds of plantains having funnel shaped leaves. Somebody put a comment on one of my observations that said, it looks like it's trying to evolve into a pitcher plant. I thought that was really funny and fascinating. And I never would have noticed that if I hadn't been using iNaturalist looking for something new to see. Um, that was way back before the pandemic. Um, that That is even more so now, got even more so during the pandemic. I discovered galls and leaf miners, both of which have very fascinating information-filled projects on iNaturalist just for gulls and leaf miners. Some of you want to record who comes to your pollinator garden or your park or your nature center. Sorry about the spacing there. That's a little awkward. Um, you can use an existing place in iNaturalist at any scale. You, uh, you can use huge scale places or you can make small scale places or sometimes find that somebody has already made a small scale place. This is my house. This is my park. I manage a native plant garden around the community center in this park and it has all kinds of interesting weeds and interesting bugs that come to it. And I found that somebody else had already created a place in iNaturalist for Lion Park. Um, there's information on the website about how to create a place. You can upload a KMZ file or you can create a place in Google and that place was already made for me. So observations that are made within this line um, automatically show up when I type Lion Park into the location field. Okay, another thing I like to do is I like to get on the, the taxon page for a species that I'm interested in. And I like to go to the taxonomy tab and I like to just scoot around this taxonomy tab. Every one of these lines is a live link that takes you to a different level taxon page. You can scoot all around and you can see how everything on earth is related to everything else. There's just something about that that I find really inspiring. So I highly recommend on the desktop looking for the species pages, looking at the various tabs on the species pages. They're full of information, including phenology information, when are the most observations of flowering and fruiting ones. They're just jam packed with information. Okay, so um, I think I have maybe just this one more slide. Um, for people who are concerned about using iNaturalist to observe ethically, I mentioned that I recommend obscuring locations on private property that is not your own. If you do not, if you have not attached a species identification to something yet, 
but even though you don't know exactly what it is, you think it might be an RTE, um, it doesn't have the, the system does not have the opportunity to automatically obscure that if there's not an identification in the field of it being an RTE, of it being a certain species. So you can go ahead and obscure the location. Um, again, it will show up on the map with enough location information that identifiers can still help you with it. RTE means rare, threatened, or endangered species. Sorry. Um, RTE, rare, threatened, or endangered species. Another thing that I suggest doing is don't feel pressure to get an identification all the way to species. If you've got a violet and you're not sure what species it is, just post it as a violet. Um, the, the community can come in and be helpful if your photographs provide enough evidence about which kind of violet it actually is. But there is nothing wrong with having half your observations or more not be research grade and not be identified to species. Um, they, they will eventually, if there are enough if you provide good enough evidence and if there's enough identifiers on iNaturalist, you will eventually get improved identifications, many of them to species, many of them will reach research grade, but don't feel pressure to say something is X species of violet if all you're confident about is that it's a violet. And then at the bottom of every screen on the desktop, there's very helpful community guidelines. Don't be a creep. Don't use iNaturalist to stalk people. If you do, you'll get blocked, you'll get um, you'll get taken off the platform. And if you are using if you are making observations with people under 13, please use the the platform that was designed specifically for youth, which is called Seek. Seek was made by the same people who use iNaturalist. It has a somewhat less robust uh, computer vision algorithm, but it cannot be used to track somebody's location. So if you're using if you're doing observations with kids, please have them use Seek. You can use Seek too. I know some adults who prefer it, um, but I prefer iNaturalist because the computer vision is is more robust. Okay, great. Um, that is all the slides that I have. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but I would be really happy to pull up iNaturalist and demonstrate anything that people want to see. And I, oh, Anne, you used to live in Ashton Heights, next neighborhood over. Um, I'm going to start looking through the chat and seeing if there are any questions that I missed while I was showing my slides. Sound good? And then, and people can raise their hands if they do have a question and we can unmute them as yeah. well. Thank you for all the usernames. It's good to see that I'm in such good company. So, so Deborah, one one yeah. question, and, and I did type the answer, but it was um, about how do you join a project? And also I would add, do you have to join projects in order to get your observations to be counted in some projects? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, there's a few different kinds of projects. Some of them you have to join for your observations to be counted, and some of them you do not. All right, I'm going to go to iNaturalist. Here is my home page. Um, here is my feed. What shows up in my feed, I can control via my settings. Um, I, I can get to that in a minute. I can and get to the forum. It's uh, usually here someplace they've kind of moved this stuff around. Um, oh yeah, here's the forum right there. So that's where to go with the really advanced questions uh, that I can't answer. Um, we want to talk about projects. So to find projects, you go to community and you can click on projects and you can see a few featured projects. You, oh, how cool is that? UV fluorescent organisms, fungi, slime molds, some scorpions. That is awesome. Look at that when you get a chance. Um, you can search on projects. So I'm going to show you what the City Nature Challenge, what last year's City Nature Challenge looks like, because there's no observations yet in City Nature Challenge 2024. Um, I'm going to, let's look at the global one, City Nature Challenge 2023. That Oh, that includes a whole bunch of stuff. Let's, in fact, let's look at just the DC City Nature Challenge for 2023. Okay. So 
This was the kind of project that automatically included all observations made within the time parameters, those four days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday of last year, end of April last year, um, and the geographic parameters. And, you know, the, the system knows because if you've turned your settings on in your phone and in iNaturalist to attach geolocation to your photos, then it knows where your observation was made automatically, even if you obscure the location. So um, a project has some really neat aggregating abilities. Um, it can pull information together about how many observations total were made. Um, it can show who made the most observations, who had the most species, what the most observed species were. All of this happens automatically when you make a project. So you can use iNaturalist in the explore function to do what I did, which is to search on a location, Lion Park. Um, but if you just search on a location, you don't get all this cool aggregation. This only comes to you, the leaderboards and everything only come to you when you make a project. I will show you a little bit about how you go about making a project. You go again to community projects, you go here to start a project. Uh, you get a welcome page. You can learn about the difference between collection projects, which are like City Nature Challenge DC area and umbrella projects, which is all the local City Nature Challenge projects in a given year. And it aggregates all of those together. There's also something called, called a traditional project, which is the kind of project that um, somebody has to join because the system can't automatically using filters add observations to that project. So um, you can learn about that right here. Um, just to give you a look at some of the other really cool projects that exist. For example, okay, an example of a project that you need to add your observations is Gauls of North America. Um, Gauls of North America. If I take a picture of a hickory, such and such gall, this looks like one of the hickory galls, um, I have to join the project, which I did up here. Um, if you haven't joined the project yet, this would say join this project for you. It says leave this project for me because I've already joined it. And when I make an individual observation, the system it would have been very difficult to program the project to automatically include all the thousands of taxa um, of species that are gall formers. So I have to add my individual observations to the project. And in order to do that, in order for that project to show up for me to add my individual observations, I have to join the project first. So that's an example of a traditional project. Okay, so somebody says, when we lead spring blitz, walks, spring blitz walks, hi, Liz, good to see you. Um, when we lead spring blitz walks for Maryland Native Plant Society and there are RTE species or orchids present along a trail, won't it be obvious even if we obscure the RTE species but use open for the other species? No, they have figured that out because you might think, oh, it, they can see that I took this picture in between 205 and 207 and it's an orchid so that must have been between these two things that she didn't obscure on the same trail when you obscure your geolocation it also obscures the exact time of your observation so other people can see that you made the observation for example in april but if they and you made it somewhere maybe in the western Maryland Panhandle area, um, but they can't see the specific time and they can't see the location specifically enough to be able to track that observation down to where it where it is on the planet because that also obscures the time. So I used to be concerned about that too, um, but they have figured out how to do that. Okay, great. Okay, so Aaron says that I had a researcher reach out about a rare variety of monkey flower he recorded. He wanted to chat about the observation. 
um, and get permission to use it. The photo and info ended up being used in the study. That's a really cool feeling, right? You contributed to science. So when you first get into your first message, when you're not used to using messages, a naturalist will say something like, "If you don't know, if you don't know the people messaging you." Um, you know, check out their credentials. So just because somebody asks you for specific information about something that you obscured the location of, don't just automatically give it to them. Do your due diligence on the person um, before you before you cough up that that information. Um, so just a little, uh, I'm sure you did that. And I'm glad that uh, your your observation information was useful for that study. Oh, I love this question from Karen. Would it be useful to upload older observations to help document changes over time? It might take some time. Yes, it, it is completely legitimate to upload your old photos from your vacation 10 years ago. Um, if you took them on a smartphone, they have the geo information, they have the time and date location, time and date information. Even if you upload old camera photos and you are putting the information about location and time and date manually, that is it is useful and that is okay and after when I first got on to my naturalist I did I went through my whole camera roll ever since I got my smartphone in 2010 and I uploaded old vacation photos of the iguana that I saw in Cancun and the things that I'd seen before I was using iNaturalist and they uh, th their observations that that is completely legitimate and it's a great way to um to have great memories about trips that you had before you were even on a naturalist and to continue learning even to this day about stuff that you saw years ago in fact i had a really cool experience there was a pressed twig from a bald cypress tree in our nasawango site files in my office at the nature conservancy and it had been sent in by the volunteer preserve steward um, in 1984. He, he took those twigs and he pressed them and he sent them in and he said, there's some kind of fungus on these Taxodium disticum twigs. And I looked at that press sample and I said, that's not a fungus. I know that's a gall. So I took a photo of the pressed sample I put it in as the observation date that he wrote in the note, which was sometime in 1982 or 1984. And I said, you know, observed by Joe Farrah Sr., who's long gone now. Um, and so the observed date is the date that he observed it and wrote the note to me. Um, the upload date was the date that I uploaded the photo that I took of the pressed specimen, but I got a very quick confirmation of the identification of that gall that was growing on that um, bald cypress twig in 1982, in the early 80s, um, and it was really gratifying, and I'm really happy that our beloved preserve steward, Joe Ferrer Sr., is in a very small way immortalized on this platform that was created years after his death. I, I just love that observation and I'm, I'm very I'm very proud that it's there. Uh, so yes, upload older photos, older observations, that is completely fine and it's very exciting sometimes. Okay, so Jim tried iNaturalist on native plants a couple of years ago. A large percentage of answers were clearly wrong. So you paid for a picture of this and most answers were quite accurate. So you'd rather pay for correct answers for correct answers than get wrong answers for free. So what are my thoughts on when the suggested answers are wrong? Yeah, when the suggested answers are wrong and you know the right answer, type it in. You don't have to just pick from what is suggested. That still happens, even though the computer vision suggestions are getting better and better. They're not always right. Um, type in what you think it is um, to the degree of specificity that you are confident about, and then upload that observation so that other people can see it and interact with it and continue to refine that species identification. It's really worth the effort. So how do you add Maryland biodiversity as a project? You go to the Maryland biodiversity project um, on iNaturalist and... I think I saved it. Um, yeah. So you go to community, you search on projects, type in Maryland biodiversity, you get to the project page. Um, it looks like this. This is where you join it. And then they also ask you 
to um, share the specific locations of your observations with their curators. How do you do that? You go to your uh, account settings and you go to relationships and you type in uh, whatever MVP curator you want. Um, I trusted, go to the second page, I trusted Jim Brighton and Bill and Bill Hubick with my hidden coordinates. So that's what it takes to make your observations eligible for ingestion into MVP from my naturalist. Real quick, we have a raised hand. Yes. Uh, Alan Brown, if you want to unmute. Yes, I'd yeah. love to hear. Yeah, what's the right way to use the suggestion algorithm without entering a new observation? Other than using seek instead. Right. So you can benefit from the suggestion algorithm and then never upload your observation. Well, how do you get started with that? I mean, I, it seems to me that when I do that, what I end up doing is adding an observation, uh, trying to see what it is, and then deleting it. Right. So, so I'm not entirely sure I'm understanding your question. So I'll say something, and then you tell me if I'm not being helpful. Um, so sometimes, oh, you know what I do? I, I see people on Facebook groups posting pictures and saying, what is this? And I, in my mind, I think, I wish they had just posted that to iNaturalist, but I want to see if iNaturalist could have identified it. So I copy their photo, I drop it into iNaturalist with an approximate location, and I see if iNaturalist could have identified it. And it usually does um, better than the people who responded to the Facebook comment. But I do not upload that because it's not my observation. I just delete it. But I've still, you can do the same thing to, to benefit from the computer vision algorithm. Um, if you don't upload it, though, uh, if you delete it or if you just keep it in your observations without uploading it, then it will not go under the skilled and helpful eyes of the community of iNaturalist users. You are you're denying yourself if you don't upload it. You're denying yourself the possibility of getting their help. Well, Does I usually upload it later, but the often often just wandering around in the field, I'd like a suggestion I for see. what do you think that is. Right. And I don't I feel funny entering an observation and then or starting to enter an observation and then deleting it. Got it. It just Got seems it. like I'm I'm cheating somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so some people ask, so what should I be uploading? What what should I be observing? Is it okay to observe the really common stuff that's a dime a dozen, like white-tailed deer or, you know, common violet? And I say, observe anything that is important or interesting or meaningful for you. I'm to the point, because I've got, this is me, I've got a lot of observations. Um, unless it's the City Nature Challenge or unless it's a new place or I'm specifically participating in a, ballo, um, uh, a bio blitz. Like when I participated in the Mallows Bay bio blitz last fall, I tried to get as many species as I could in the three hours that I was there. I was getting, I was observing the really common ones as well because I wanted to help that site contribute to their species count. And I thought I might be catching something that somebody overlooked. So I would never have done a common violet in my own neighborhood, but I was happy to do a common violet at Mallows Bay because I wanted to augment their species list. So nobody's going to be judgy uh, about you uploading something common or something obscure. Really, how you use iNaturalist is completely is completely your call. People use it in all different ways for all different reasons. I guess it's just the gesture of create, you know, starting to enter something and stopping that bothers me. So I, I pick up seek, which you just point at something and say, what do you think it is, mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially, and you get the answer. And that's what I was looking for. Yeah. So if that works Except for you. That then... Seek doesn't have quite the same algorithm. Yeah, it, it doesn't. Um, a lot of people have trouble getting past DICOT. What, what I was recently told was that Seek 
give species suggestions before you even snap the picture. And if the, you move it around a little bit, it'll yeah. refine the, yeah, I didn't, I did not understand that originally. If Sika's working for you, then keep using it. And there's well, a button I, that you can push so that your seek observations still go to iNaturalist and still count for the City Nature Challenge. So I hope you'll do that this weekend. Well, I was hoping for a suggestion that made uh, iNaturalist feel like seek. Where, yeah. where I, I wouldn't feel like I was making something and taking it back. I don't think you need to feel like you're cheating if you use iNaturalist. Don't feel inhibited. The 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 platform <laughs> is welcoming. The community is welcoming. Try liberating yourself from any feeling of cheating and try iNaturalist because I think that when you upload your observations through iNaturalist, you will start experiencing some really positive and helpful interactions from the user community. That's what I think. Well, so I, I think eventually upload almost all these things. I'm just thinking as as process. As I'm walking around in the field, I want to know what things are. And then later, when I've taken a bunch of pictures, I can upload a few of them. Yep. <laughs> The question is, why do you not want to upload those things onto iNaturalist? It's not that I don't want to upload them. I don't want to upload them while I'm walking around in the field. Oh, right. I don't, so you, I right. want to upload them from my computer after I've picked the ones that I really like. Right. And I can put them in in the order in which here's the presentation picture and here's another picture yeah. and here's the back of the leaf. So and what you do, Alan, is make sure your app is set up to not automatically upload. And then you can take one photo yeah. in your app. And then when you are in the safety of electricity and um, yeah. Wi-Fi yeah. and free data, then you can you can upload that one observation and then you can add observations. You can add images to that one observation and then do all that other stuff that you were talking about. Okay, that so is... what I think I'm learning is that I can make an observation and not upload it. Correct. That's what I haven't been doing. Yeah, yep, yep. And Karen is uh, right. And thank you, Karen, for, for, for hearing a, a part of that question that I was not picking up on. So you can go to the settings in your app and you can turn off automatic upload, your, your iNaturalist app. I have turned off automatic upload because I I don't want all this stuff uploading while I'm in the field. Um, I That's too much data. It's too much battery. I, like you, prefer to do the uploading when I can see a little better and I'm relaxed and leisurely. So you might give that a try. I think you'll have a good experience. Okay. So, um, oh, how to join the DC Area City Nature Challenge. Well, thank you for asking. If you are any place in that area that, that I showed you, if you are uh, any place in central Maryland or Northern Virginia, and you make observations using iNaturalist between a minute after midnight on Friday morning and a minute or and midnight on Monday night, your observations are automatically included. You don't have to join the City Nature Challenge. However, if you do join the DC Area City Nature Challenge, and I will show you what this year's project looks like so far. I go to community projects. I'm going to search on city DC 2024. And it's going to give me this year's city nature challenge for the Washington DC metro area. If you go ahead and join up here, um, I've already joined, so it doesn't have that button on for me. But if you join up here, you will more easily be able to get notifications about new journal posts. And we do have some fun journal posts queued up. Um, examples of journal posts. Uh, maybe you remember that that weekend last year was incredibly rainy. So we had some really interesting and helpful tips um, in the journal posts and the comments about making the most of rainy days on iNaturalist, including um, a really good tip that I got from somebody else was I, I kept, I would put my iPhone in my pocket, but it was so wet that 
all kinds of crazy things were happening. And my iPhone was just like automatically posting this gobbledygook to Facebook. It was really kind of funny and embarrassing. And then in the journal discussion, somebody suggested having a, a, a rag in the bottom of your pocket to absorb all of that extra moisture, all that extra rain that was on, on my iPhone. And that solved the problem. Um, if it's rainy, you can stay inside and work on identifications. Um, so discussions like that, we, we aim to get those going in the journal posts. And if you join the project, you'll get notifications even on your smartphone about when there's a new journal post. Your notifications. Um, your notifications on your desktop will look like this. And I had mentioned that you can control the kind of stuff that you get notified about in your settings. And I was getting so many notifications because I was doing a lot of identifications. I decided to turn off notifications about people agreeing with my identifications. Now I only get notifications about people refining my identifications. Like if I got something from violet to common blue violet, and I get notifications about people disagreeing with my identifications. And I'll tell you what, my ego took a big hit when I quit getting notifications about agreeing IDs. Because all of a sudden, I was only hearing about people who disagreed with me or who were smarter than me. Um, but that's how we learn. It was just my way of, of keeping myself from getting hundreds of notifications during a time that I was doing a lot of IDs. And you can easily change those settings by going here, uh, profile account settings, notifications, and you have all these choices. If people mention me in a comment on their observation, like if they're saying, hey, pay attention to this observation, I need your ID help. They go at sign D Barber and I get a notification about that because I have chosen to. It shows up right here with my other notifications. Um, I turned off the confirming ID notifications and that's when my ego took a hit, but I have more time now for other things. Um, and you can also say what notifications you want to receive via email. So I turned off those because it was way too much. Now the daily email that I get only contains information about messages. If people post um, uh, new journal entries and projects that I belong to and these other things. So you have all these choices, you get to them through your settings, which is up here next to your little profile photo. So I, so I told you there's way more that iNaturalist does on the desktop. So if you haven't checked it out on the desktop, I highly recommend it. Uh, you can easily get into identify mode. When you're in identify mode, you can open up the filter and say you only want to identify plants in the Washington metro area, for example. This is the kind of stuff that we focus on. Um, on our iNaturalist nights, and then you can open up an individual observation. You can get suggestions um, based on number of observations or visual similarity about what that species might be. Um, you can research and do your due diligence. You can see, oh, there's a lot of those around here because um, of this heat map, that might be a good guess. You can get to the species page. All of these are iNaturalist power user tricks that are available to you on the desktop version. I recommend scooting around on the desktop version. You will just keep learning and learning and learning. I think you will be fascinated. If you post an insect, Janet, is there a way to note what plant it was on? Absolutely. Um, I would definitely, if possible, insects are fast, but do try to get a photo that shows what plant it's on. In addition, you can make all kinds of comments. I'm gonna to go to my observations and I'm just gonna open up um, this observation. Open up, please. Um, so you can, uh, you have got, you've got a comment field. Um, now this observation was about the leaf mining insect. So I added it to the Leaf Miners of North America project. Um, I could also have put a comment in the comment field that this was on Harry Bittercrest. 
um, Cardamini hirsuta. But I felt that that was adequately demonstrated in the photo. And I also said it, oh, I also said it here. There's an observation field for the Leaf Miners of North America project that gives you a chance to say what it was on. So um, you can always, short answer, you can always just write a comment to give more information about your observation. All right, great. And I, and I know we're running late, but the other thing, yeah. Jen, you can duplicate your observation and identify it to the plant and then just let, in the comments you can, and yep. I have multiple where I say that the insect is a different observation and then this is for the plant. And then you can join the uh, ignore the elephant seal project so that when you find a tiny little insect on a plant and people keep identifying your your plant and you're like, no, it's really the insect <laughs> that you're identifying. Yes. So. Yep. So I hope to see some of the usernames that you all posted uh, early in this Zoom uh, popping up in the City Nature Challenge DC area project. And um, perhaps you will join us for one of our ID nights. Uh, those are on Tuesday, April 30th, or Tuesday or Thursday, May 2nd. Uh, there's information about those and the Zoom link to join on a tab of that City Nature Challenge DC.org website. Uh, in short, I have enjoyed being with you virtually tonight, and I hope to see you on iNaturalist over the weekend. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Deborah. This was really great. And I hope everybody's um, super psyched about trying all the powerful aspects of iNaturalist, because I know when I see new people using it, they're like, it didn't give me a good identification. And the computer vision is just such a small aspect of iNaturalist. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for joining and, um, Hopefully, if you're available to join Deborah on her trip, it is a, a limited to a small number, so we can't have 300 people join <laughs> Deborah. But um, and then keep your eye on the website for other upcoming events. So, thanks a lot. Great job! Right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye.